Yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm Alex. I'm excited to be here talking about DynamoDB. Uh, as Eric said, I do, a lot of, I do a lot of talks on DynamoDB, a lot of data modeling um, over the last five years. Um, I, I don't think it makes sense to do data modeling here just because we're talking about DynamoDB in an EDA world, and I think there's nothing really specific to, there's not that much specific to EDA for, for data modeling. But what I want to talk about here is, is how and why Dynamo fits so well in an EDA world, because I think Dynamo has a lot of unique characteristics for a database, um, both in terms of like some really nice strengths and capabilities and features, and also some like unique weaknesses or uh, you know, missing features, I would say, compared to other databases. I think Dynamo just fits really well in an EDA world. I think, I think its strengths are accentuated. I think its weaknesses are, are muted a little bit. So I just want to talk about that today. Um, so I want to start off and just talk about, hey, what's unique about DynamoDB in general? I like to start off by saying, hey, it's, it's, it's both fully managed and proprietary to AWS. And these, these go together in an interesting way. So it's proprietary to AWS. You can't run DynamoDB in, in GCP or Azure or on-prem. You can't run an EC2 in, in AWS. Like it's, it's only a, a service that you can use from AWS directly. Um, and I actually, you know, there's some downsides to that, but there are also some upsides in the sense that like, they can really make this a more fully managed service than they can even for something like RDS, a relational database service, right? This is, this is a region-wide, multi-tenant service where all the users in a given region are basically using the same DynamoDB infrastructure, uh, which is great. So it's more like S3, SQS in that way. And the fact that it's proprietary to AWS means they don't have to make it sort of like lowest common denominator that you can run it yourself if you want to. Um, different things like that. We good to go? Yeah. Better? Much better? OK, sorry. Um, cool. So yeah, Dynamo is um, proprietary to AWS, but because of that, you get some really nice fully managed capabilities from DynamoDB. Now, DynamoDB's like, main claim, the main thing it's really aiming for is consistent, predictable performance at any scale. right? And we talk about any scale. Um, at reInvent last year, one of the senior principals on the DynamoDB team put this slide up there, just about some of the usage of their higher scale clients on Dynamo, right? where they have hundreds of customers that are doing half a million requests per second. They have hundreds of customers that are doing a billion requests per hour. And they have hundreds of customers that have tables over 200 terabytes each. And these are disjoint customers in some ways, right? Some that have really huge tables, some that have high peaks, and some that have you know, pretty sustained load over a long period of time, right? So Dynamo is serving some of the biggest workloads on the planet. So it's aiming for that consistent, predictable performance at any scale. And, and two ways it really goes about that. Number one is just how its architecture works. I mentioned that Dynamo is this sort of region-wide, multi-tenant service. And if you look at the architecture at a really high level, it looks something like this, where when you reach out to the Dynamo service, it's going to hit this region-wide endpoint. That's going to go to this giant fleet of load balancers that are shared across all the customers in a given region. That's going to do TLS termination, forward it along to these request routers, where it's going to authenticate your request. It's going to look up metadata about your table, figure out where your data lives, and then forward that request to one of, one of these you know, enormous fleet of, of storage nodes that actually hold your data and either write your data or read your data from one of those nodes and handle that. And again, this is shared across the region. So if you're running US East 1, you're probably running with Uber and Snap and Disney and Amazon.com and all these other enormous customers. So that's part of the way they get that consistent performance at any scale. They have this horizontally scalable architecture that can, that can work really well. Um, but on the other side, it's, it's also like a more reduced feature set, right? Dynamo doesn't do all the things that a relational database does. For some background on this, because um, you know, it's in this, this more unique category of NoSQL, um, I think it's worth sort of understanding Dynamo, the Dynamo paper. This came out in 2006, 2007. And this isn't DynamoDB. This is Dynamo, which is like an internal database that Amazon.com engineers built for themselves when they were having scaling issues for Amazon retail. Like this is before AWS, they built this. Um, some pretty unique names on there, Swami, Werner Vogels, and, and a lot of other really distinguished folks from Amazon. Um, and Werner, looking at this 10 years later, just reflecting back on Dynamo and the way they built it, the, the way that they did. You don't have to read all this, but, but understand they were looking at their high scale use cases and realizing, hey, a, a vast majority of their use cases were accessing a single row you know, identified by its primary key. You know, another 20% of that would just get a, a set of rows, a range of rows from an individual table. So they didn't really need all the capabilities of a relational database. And what they did is they said, hey, we can build something that can scale better, give us more consistent, predictable performance um, by reducing some of the features we give, right? So that's sort of like 
the, the upside and downside of Dynamo. You get that, that nice architecture, but you also get this reduced feature set. Um, and what I'll, what I'll sort of claim today is it's an awesome fit for event-driven applications, right? So this is, you know, this is in my humble opinion, but I think it, it really accentuates the upsides and, and mutes the downsides um, the way Dynamo works. All right, so let's talk about Dynamo in an EDA world. Just an overview of what I want to talk about today. You know, I started off with what's unique about Dynamo, give you a, a flavor of that. I do want to talk a bit about what are event-driven applications, which I've, I've seen a few other people do as well, but I want, I want to set it up just so we have like the same terminology here as we continue to go here, and also register some of like, hey, what, what's good, what's hard about event-driven applications? And then we'll look at, hey, why is DynamoDB good in a producer application in event-driven architecture, and why is DynamoDB good in a consumer? Uh, who am I? I'm Alex Debris. I'm an AWS data hero, and I wrote the DynamoDB book, which is a comprehensive guide to data modeling with DynamoDB. Uh, we're going to have some books um, to give away today, but they didn't get shipped here in time, unfortunately, so sorry about that. Uh, reach out if you want a copy. Um, I don't work for AWS, but I, I, you know, I like AWS. I, I do a lot of work um, just in the DynamoDB space. Um, also just saying, I love Poland. Like, it's, it's been super fun to visit here, great weather. Um, I've worked with some really great Polish engineers over the years. These are like some of my favorite people, so I'm glad to visit. And also, I have some Polish, uh, you know, lineage myself. My great-grandma, Valeria Chizik, I think, uh, was born here in Warsaw in 1897. I don't know if any of you maybe went to grade school with her or anything like that. Uh, but she left for Omaha, Nebraska, which is where I live in 1911, so she's, she's been gone for a while. But um, yeah, I, I think I'm like the first member of my extended family to make it back here, so I'm excited to be here. All right, cool. So let's do what are event-driven applications. Um, event-driven applications, let's just walk through it You know, using uh, a typical architecture that we have here. We'll start with a user service, because most applications are going to have some notion of a user. With that user service, let's say a request comes in to create a user. As part of the work it's doing within that user service in this event-driven application, right, it's going to be producing onto an event bus, an event stream, something like that. It's going to be publishing an event saying, what has happened in this application, right? So in this case, it's publishing this event, it's user created, it's got some data on that. And now I can have different services that are subscribed to that event bus and, and do some work on that, right? And I'm guessing a lot of y'all know that, but I just want to point out, hey, we got the, the producer. So in terms of vocabulary, we have that producer that's actually producing the event. We also have these consumers. So those are the two big vocab words we want there. Um, and you know, most services will be both producers and consumers at different times um, in their life cycle. So what are event-driven applications, right? These are applications that communicate by publishing and consuming events. Just to contrast this with a few different types of application patterns, Eric talked about this as well, but like, hey, synchronous communication, right? HTTP, RPC, so if you have like a client server, a front end talking to a back end, synchronous communication there over HTTP. I love doing that in a lot of ways because you get really nice feedback on um, you know, if there's an error, if something happened. It's, it's really rich that way. It's not sort of like a, a murder mystery finding, finding out what went wrong if there's an error. Uh, but there's some downsides to synchronous communication as well. A lot of times, those downsides with synchronous communication can be resolved with asynchronous communication. Asynchronous, but what I call intentful, so not event-driven uh, architectures, but intentful things where you're putting a record into a queue. You're, put, you're starting off a, a state machine, you know, using AWS step functions, something like that, but using it in an intentful way rather than this more decoupled way um, of event-driven applications, right? So I like those patterns quite a bit as well, but event-driven is great too. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would say is like, I think sometimes event-driven gets, gets confused with like certain types of compute like Lambda. Um, but you, you know, event-driven applications are independent of the compute that you're using, the database that you're using. So we're going to talk about Dynamo here, but you can do event-driven with relational databases with whatever you want to do there. And again, the two big elements we're going to have there are both the producer and the consumer. I do want to talk about challenges with event-driven applications, because I think I was sort of a slow convert to event-driven applications due to some of the challenges and the complexity you get there. I think number one, these are usually going to be microservices, right? And microservices add complexity to your application, right? Now you have to deal with deployment of more services. You have to deal with data boundaries and how do you sort of communicate data across that sort of thing. Um, but event-driven applications are almost always going to be microservices because I think it doesn't make 
that much sense to do event-driven communication within you know, a larger monolithic service. And I think a good article sort of on this point is, is from Jan Trey, uh, the Burning Monk. He's got this, this post on choreography versus orchestration in the land of service, serverless, where he talks about, hey, when should you use event-driven applications, use event bu bridge to communicate between applications, and when should you use something uh, more orchestration-like, like a step function to sort of declare uh, the intent that you want to do and walk through certain steps, right? So I think that's a really good uh, piece if you haven't read that one. The other thing I would say is like, hey, event-driven is often used to reduce coupling. Um, oh crap. I'm going to keep messing with this and I'm freaking out. Okay. Okay, so... Event-driven often used to reduce coupling uh, uh, across your application. There are a couple of different types of coupling you can be met. A little higher, sorry. There we go. Okay, I feel like I can hear my breathing. It's freaking me out. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, it's often used to reduce coupling. Part of that is just going to be like coupling of uptime, right? Because you might have different workloads or different components in your application that have... Um, you know, different resource needs, or maybe you're using a third-party service and you don't want to tie your, your uptime to that third-party service. I would say event-driven application can help with that, but again, other asynchronous patterns might be better for reducing like coupling of uptime, right? If you have a resource-intensive task or a time-intensive task, kicking that off to a queue or something um, intentful can be better there. You good? Cool. A second type of coupling is like coupling of intent. And I think this is what a lot of people talk about initially when they talk about, hey, we're decoupling, we're moving to event-driven architectures and things like that, where it's like, hey, you know, this one service is going to do something, it's going to publish, and then all these other services, they can do whatever they want. That initial service doesn't need to know about that. And I think that's useful in some cases, but also like in a lot of cases, I think that's overdone. Like if you have, I think the canonical example I see here is like, some sort of ordering service or an e-commerce service where like something is taking the order and then a different thing is fulfilling the order. And it's like, hey, you can decouple that intent, but really those, those are pretty coupled, right? If, if you take the order, you actually want to like fulfill the order in some way. It reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you all watch Seinfeld here, but like he tries to make a car rental reservation and they like take the reservation, but they don't have the car for him, right? And he's like, you know how to take the reservation, but you don't know how to hold it, which is like the important part of it, right? So... I think that decoupling of intent can be good in some cases. I would say like clickstream data, right? If you're talking about like, um, you know, clickstream data that's coming from the front end. I think if you look at like Kafka and, and the way that was built at LinkedIn, and it's taking that and, and making those into like decoupled sort of data-driven recommendations or notifications and things like that, that's a good place where like decoupling of intent is okay. But in a lot of places you do have, your intent is more, is more coupled there. So then... I think the most common way you're actually like reducing coupling between these applications is this coupling of the development process, right? Where you have a large team, a lot of different services, a lot of things going on. You don't want to have this huge monolith. I think David Anderson was talking about, hey, a huge monolith with 35 teams all working in this large monolith. We want to decouple that and allow people to deploy independently and move quicker. And it's like, hey, there's, there's some coupled intent there. And I know like teams need to work together in different ways. Um, around that, but, um, um, you know, so like there's still some coupling, but you're decoupling that development process and allowing people to move faster that way. And I think that's where event-driven applications can really be useful. <clears throat> so my big takeaway on event-driven applications, like, hey, it's really great, but also like understand what you're giving up. I think James um, Easton did a really good talk about like observability in event-driven applications and, and how that's a lot harder than it is with like a synchronous application or even those intentful asynchronous applications, right? So you really need to think about that. How are you observing that? Um, how are you knowing uh, who's using your events, different things like that? And then also know, know why you're decoupling and what you're decoupling. Um, because you might have to like deal with some trade-offs elsewhere in your application, in your team, things like that. All right, cool. So now let's talk DynamoDB and get into that and why it works so well with event-driven applications, right? So if we go back to that event-driven application, again, we have our producers and our consumers. I want to talk about two reasons why Dynamo works so well in an event-driven uh, producer, right? And, the, and 
The first problem I want to talk about is what, is, what I've called the dual right problem, or, or what's known as a dual right problem. Do people generally know the dual right problem? You heard of this? Cool. So let's talk about this. Let's go back to our adventure of an application we were talking about before, where we have this user service, and I was saying, hey, that user service is going to you know, send off this event that this user was created. But that's not really the point of that service. First, it's got to like, do something like saving that data somewhere, right? So it's going to save it in a table, make sure we can actually create that user in our application. And then once it's done that, then it writes out to our event bus or our stream or whatever so that people can do it, right? So what we have are, are two different writes to two different external systems. We have our actual database where we want to write that record, but then we also want to publish that event, right? And the problem with those two events is, hey, what happens if there's issues with your event bus, or for whatever reason, you can't publish that event, right? And now, you've sort of got these two external systems that are supposed to be kept in sync in some way, and now um, you are only able to update one of them without updating the second one, right? So what happens there? I think this is the first problem you're going to run into when you're working with event-driven applications, and there's some bad solutions to, event, to the tool to do a right problem, right? So the first one is just retries. People are like, hey, why don't I just retry this a couple times to my event bus. And that can work, uh, but what it's going to do is it's going to add latency to your request, right? So now if you're creating a user, now you got to wait for it to be retried a couple times. And more importantly, like, hey, retries aren't going to solve all your problems there. Like, your event bus could legitimately be down, or there could be issues with that service. And how are you going to, you know, get that back in sync, uh, get that event published eventually? So retries help a little bit, but not really going to save you there. Some people think, hey, what if I just flip the order of it and I'll publish the event first and then I'll write to the database. But like, that's not going to work, right? You still have the dual write problem. You've just flipped the order of these things. I mean, you could technically say, hey, you know, I'm publishing an intent to create a user and now your downstream consumers, maybe when they, when they consume that event, need to make sure that it actually happened. But you're pushing a lot of complexity down to your, your consumers that I, I would not recommend. And then finally, you could use a database transaction, right? So in your database, maybe you open a transaction, you write that user to your, record, to your user's table, and then while keeping that transaction open, now you can reach out to your external service, try and publish that um, to, the, to the event bus there. If that doesn't work, then you roll back the entire transaction um, and, and prevent that. And, but there's some downsides there too. Like number one, like the, the commit of your, your transaction could still fail. So now you have like sort of a triple write problem rather than just a dual write problem. Um, it also like blocks creation of your users or blocks creation of whatever like actual event you want to do. You're blocking that if your event bus is, is actually down. Uh, and then finally, you're just, you're just holding these open database connections, right? And, and sort of tying up resources and locks and all sorts of things in your database. So you don't really want to do that one either. So those are three, I would say, bad solutions to the dual write problem. Uh, but there are a couple good solutions, so we're in luck here. Uh, first one is you can do what's called the transactional outbox pattern, right? Where when you're doing this, you, you open up a transaction to your database and you're writing a user record, but you're also writing you know, some intent to deliver an event or, or that a user was updated or created or something into a separate table in your application. And then something, once you commit that, you know, something's going to be sort of processing that outbox table publishing events or doing whatever needs to happen with that. And you get some transactionality, you get some resiliency around, um, around publishing that event without blocking it um, you know, if your event bus happens to be down. That can work. Um, it does require, you know, it adds some additional load to your database. You're doing more transactions, you're writing more rows and things like that. And then you're also pulling from that table quite frequently. The better approach, the best approach, I would say, is just using change data capture. And this is where DynamoDB can come in, right? So if we go back to our, our service here, right? Let's, let's remove that second write to our event bus. Let's change that RDS to a DynamoDB table. And now on our DynamoDB table, let's enable DynamoDB streams, right? And what DynamoDB streams do is they, anytime you write to your database, view an insert, update, delete, anything like that, it's going to drop a record of that into your DynamoDB stream. And now this is a stream just like Kinesis or Kafka or anything like that. You can consume off that, consume those right events, and you can package them up and publish them an event to your event bus and, and get those consumed by your services there. Right? So, so what's going on with DynamoDB streams is every write operation on your table is going to get placed into a DynamoDB stream that you can then process. And this is going to be easily consumable via a Lambda function. You can also process it yourself like on EC2 instances or containers if you want to, but very easy to do with Lambda function, which is very nice. And also if you're doing it via a Lambda function, it's not going to cost you anything. So DynamoDB streams, there's no cost to actually write into those streams to enable it. The only cost you have are reading from that streams. And if you do it from Lambda, it's free. So um, pretty good, pretty easy to use there. 
In terms of working with DynamoDB streams, it's very similar to mechanics to Kinesis and, Kinesis and Kafka. So if you saw Anahit's presentation earlier and learned about like stream processing, some of the failure modes on consumers, I think that's really uh, useful and, and similar here. You know, basically you have an ordered event log where the consumers are tracking the position. So you're not like popping off events and, and processing like in a queue, you're, you're, they're just staying there and you're tracking your position in this event log. The one thing I would say is like, hey, you don't want to use Dynamo streams as your event bus directly, even though you can use Kinesis or Kafka as your event bus. And the, the reason for this, you know, I guess what you want to do there is you want to have that event bus in the middle. You might be tempted to take that event bus out and just have your services, your downstream services read from that DynamoDB stream. Uh, but the problem with this is Dynamo wants to limit the amount of consumers you have on the stream. They really want you, only want you to have two concurrent consumers on that stream. So you're probably going to get throttled here. Uh, it's not going to be a good situation. So you want to put that event bus in the middle or, or some other com consumer and then publish the event bus in the middle that's, that's better meant for fan out. So there's that limit of two concurrent consumers on that stream. Another problem is like, hey, that's going to be a pretty raw format that you're getting from that database, right? It's going to be like kind of a database record. It's going to have uh, your PK and SK, like sort of internal database stuff. Um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that downstream consumers aren't going to care about. Whereas like, hey, your, your domain, your service can take that event, it can package it up and understand, hey, was this a new user that's created? Is it an updated? Is it deleted? Things like that and package it up into a nicer format to be consumed by your, by your end users. So yeah, my recommendation there is the service that's actually owning that DynamoDB table, that's the one that should consume those records. It can just use that one consumer there to do that and, and publish events from its own stream. If you want to know more about the dual right problem, this guy, Gunnar Morling, he's really great about it. He's got uh, this idea of friends don't let friends do dual rights. And you really do run into a lot of problems with those dual rights where you get inconsistent systems. So I would, I would strongly avoid that if you can. Um, if you want to look in this in like other non-DynamoDB places, Debezium is, is this tool that's used to basically give you similar semantics from like relational databases, even MongoDB, where it's going to be tailing like the bin log or the rep some sort of replication log for those databases and creating events and, and putting them into Kafka for us. So you can get some similar semantics there. The one thing I like about Dynamo is, again, it's got that, that multi-tier decoupled architecture. So when it's pushing those events to those streams, you can consume that, that stream, and it's not going to have any impact on your upstream database at all. It's on a totally different piece of, uh, it's, it's on a totally different node. It's not going to be messing with your storage nodes or anything like that as compared to Debezium, which is like sharing that, those resources with your, your actual production traffic. All right, so that's our first issue is the dual write problem with a producer. Uh, I got another scary problem here, though, the giant table problem, right? So we just got our two problems in the, the EDA producer world. And I thought of this one when I was sort of surfing Twitter one day, and I saw Sam Lambert, who he's the CEO of Planet Scale, which is like a sharded MySQL, so uh, a very scalable MySQL solution. And he asked people, hey, what's the name of your largest database table? And I think a lot of people empathize with Josh, when, Josh Bronchild when he said events, right? I just have this table with events in it, and it has uh, just like this mess of data. And, and you think if you have this, um, with this giant table problem, you might have an event table that's much larger than your other application data, right? If you're doing that transactional outbox pattern, your outbox that's, that's tracking all the changes to these records is going to be much bigger than your, your, your sort of core data, right? Because you only create a user once or you update it and you have that one user record. But every time you make an update, you have to put a record in that transactional outbox table. Or maybe you're doing like the storage first pattern, things like that, and you're, you're just storing a lot of sort of like raw data in this events table that, that's getting sent out elsewhere. You also might have like a pretty significant variability in usage over time. So not only do you have this giant table that you need to maintain the storage and the indexes and all that stuff for, but you might have pretty different variability in usage, right? And I look at Luke von Donkersgood, who he's an AWS hero. He just posted on PostNL's serverless journey. He does a lot of event-driven stuff that's really good. But he showed this is what PostNL's traffic looks like during the day, during the week. And you can see, hey, there's significant variability within a day where it goes up a, you know, an order of magnitude during a day. Or you can see like during the week, hey, Sunday is not getting any traffic as compared to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, much higher traffic than the rest of those, right? So you can see significant variability during the day. And, if, and most traditional databases are going to make you provision for peak on that. Uh, with Dynamo, you don't have to do that. So how does DynamoDB help here? Not only do you get that consistent performance at any scale, like we talked about, hey, your events table, no matter how big it is, it's probably not 200 terabytes. You're going to be fine there. 
Um, but in addition to that, you, can, you have flexible billing and scaling to sort of scale your database up and down for your usage as needed, right? So Luke was showing, hey, this is our traffic during the day. He also showed their DynamoDB consumption and provision there. So he's got this chart. That, that blue, that's how much they're actually consuming in Dynamo during the week. And then that, that reddish orange is, is how much they're provisioned for in their DynamoDB table. So they've got auto scaling set up. And you can see how it just follows their traffic pretty well. And you can see there's, there's like a 10 or 20x um, difference between like their peak and their trough in terms of how much provision capacity they're doing, which is, it's just not something you're gonna do with a relational database, right? That's gonna be pretty static in terms of like how big that is. But with Dynamo, you can scale that up um, during the day, during the week, during the month to meet your needs. So Dynamo's got that flexible billing and scaling to change your capacity up and down to meet needs. If you don't know how much capacity you need, if, if it's unpredictable, if you just don't want to deal that with that, it also has like a pay-per-use billing option. So just like S3, SQS, Lambda, API Gateway, like all these services we know and love, you can use Dynamo and just do pay-per-use and not have to provision any capacity for it. And it's just going to handle that um, almost without limit unless you like, you know, some very extreme situations. It's going to work pretty well on that. So just looking at Dynamo in an EDA producer, I think it solves two of the problems in that world of a producer, right? That dual write problem where you're, you're keeping your systems out of sync or getting your systems out of sync and that giant table problem where you have this, this amount of data that's, that's sort of disproportionate, has, has weird workloads and, and things like that. <clears throat> All right, so what about on the other end of the spectrum, right? How does Dynamo work in an EDA consumer? So looking back at our e event-driven applications, right? Over on this consumer side, how is, how is Dynamo helping here? And I think there are two points I want to make out here. And, and I, I mentioned earlier about um, DynamoDB's feature set, right? It has a more a targeted, narrower feature set. And I think that's less of a concern in this world of event-driven architecture, right? So generally, when you have these event-driven architectures, you have smaller, more focused services. You don't have these larger monoliths that are, that are doing a lot of things, storing a lot of different kinds of data, right? So again, we talked about what's unique to Dynamo. It has that, that narrower feature set. What do I mean by that? I think the easiest way to think about it up front is like, hey, there's no query planner in Dynamo. So like when you're submitting a query in a relational database or even MongoDB, right, it's going to parse that query. It's going to, you know, look at your, your table definitions, your indexes, your table statistics, all that stuff, and figure out the most efficient way to handle that. Um, Dynamo doesn't have a query planner. It's basically giving you like direct access to these data structures in like this, this horizontally scalable way. And because it doesn't have a query planner, it's, it's missing some like core features that you'd miss from like a more uh, featureful database, right? It doesn't have joins. You can't join data from two different tables together. You can't do aggregations. You can't say, hey, get all, this user, get all these user records and sum them up and tell me what that total is or what's the largest order that this customer's ever made or what's the smallest reading from this IoT sensor or anything like that. No aggregations in Dynamo. And it doesn't even have like flexible filtering, right? What if you wanted to do like index intersections and use multiple indexes to help with a query. It's not going to do that. It doesn't have any of, of those sorts of things. And I think this is like the biggest objection I get from Dynamo is like, hey, it's, it's missing a lot of the things I wish it had. Um, so even though it has that consistent performance at any scale, uh, because it's missing these things, it's, it's hard to use. But I think that's less of an issue, again, in, in this world of event-driven architecture where we have these like narrower services, right? The mail service, the widget service, the team service, whatever. It's only like they're only dealing with one or two entities. You're not really... Um, doing these, these large joins or aggregations or things like that, right? So I think Dynamo's limitations are less relevant in a world of event-driven applications. <clears throat> so event-driven applications, like we said, it's microservices, so usually smaller applications. I think you're also like accustomed to dealing with data duplication because these, these consumers, they're like downstream applications. They're not the owners of that source data. So they're used to sort of dealing with duplication and, and, and uh, denormalization and things like that, which are important in um, Dynamo's sort of NoSQL modeling there. And then you just have those like smaller, more focused access patterns, right? Like what Werner Vogel was saying, you're usually just getting an individual record. Maybe you're operating on a range of records, but you don't have like these giant joins and queries across multiple different tables or, or lots of complex filtering generally. <coughs> so that's how Dynamo works uh, or helps in an EDA consumer with, with those small focused services. I think, I think it mitigates some of those downsides, those e event-driven applications. Another thing, um, and Eric touched on this a little bit, is just it, it does help with idempotency and duplication management, right? So you're going to have duplicates, you're going to have failures in your event-driven architecture, right? It's really hard 
some would say impossible to have exactly one messaging. It sort of depends on definition there. But like, likely you're not going to get a, uh, exactly once delivery of messages. It's hard to have idempotence in your messaging system. And even like what Eric was showing about, hey, you can, do, you can get idempotence in your SQS FIFO queue. You can get it in your state machines. You can't get it in EventBridge, right? That's just not meant for it. Message, messaging systems aren't as good for that sort of thing. Um, but the good thing is Dynamo is actually really good at, at managing duplicates um, or, or handling idempotency. So Dynamo has condition expressions, which can be surprising to people because people hear that, hey, Dynamo has eventual consistency. I've dealt with eventual consistency in something like Cassandra. I know I can't like manage conditions that way. Uh, but Dynamo actually has some architectural differences with Cassandra that, that make it work better. So I think eventual consistency is less of an issue. Um, <coughs> I would love to go deep on this architecture, but um, I, I don't think I can. But just like a little sense of it, right? If we looked at that architecture and look at these storage nodes, uh, these storage nodes are probably going to be like two terabytes of data holding all this data from a lot of different customers. If we look at Dynamo and what's happening behind the scenes, right? If you have a DynamoDB table, what they're going to be doing is sharding your data across a lot of different partitions, right? So basically every 10 gigs of data, they're going to shard that and put it on a different partition, put it on a different storage node that's co-located with all these other different nodes. So if you look at those tables that have 200 terabytes, they're going to be spread across like 2,000 storage nodes, right? Something like that. And if you drill into one of these partitions, oops, sorry, I guess, yeah, when a request comes in, that request router is figuring out which partition the request goes to. And if you look at one of these partitions, right, and drill into that, that's actually going to be three nodes working together to replicate this data to give you better durability, give you better availability. And this is where some of that eventual consistency on Dynamo comes in. This is going to be called a replica group, um, where all these nodes are working together. And when a write comes into DynamoDB, it, it's going to hit that, and it's going to make sure it commits to two of those three nodes before it acknowledges it back to you. That eventual consistency can come, can come on the reads if you hit that third node, if it's trailing. But the important thing here is Dynamo has a leader. It has a strong leader model within its replica group. And this is different from Cassandra. This is different from the original Dynamo. And that allows you to use condition expressions, right? So condition expressions, again, Dynamo uses that strong leader model. This is different than Apache Cassandra or the original Dynamo, which are some of those like original NoSQL databases similar to DynamoDB in certain ways, but different enough, especially in this, that, that you can, um, I think you can get some better um, capabilities out of it. The key here is you can specify conditions on any write operation you do. So when you write to Dynamo, you can say, hey, make sure that this doesn't exist or make sure that this condition is true. And if that condition is false, the write is rejected. So Eric was talking about like using an idempotency token in your events, right? And you can use that idempotency token or some other identifier, maybe it's a user ID, whatever it is, to avoid double processing items, right? And so whether that's an upstream system that's like double publishing events for some reason, you need to deduplicate there, or whether that's, hey, you're, you're processing a batch of records and, and maybe you, know, you had a failure halfway through and you reprocess that batch, you can make sure you're not double processing some of those records there. So I like to think of Dynamo as like a pool of idempotency and there's like, you know, rivers of potential duplicates in, in your messaging systems like that, but then you have Dynamo which like can enforce that, that idempotency for you. So you can use condition expressions. Those are going to work for single item constraints. So if you're working on a single record and just saying, hey, make sure this user doesn't already exist or something like that, you can, that's what condition expressions are great for. Sometimes you need to have conditions across multiple different records, and that's where Dynamo does have transactions, right? People think of tr transactions as not a, a NoSQL thing. That's more of a relational database thing. But Dynamo's added transactions uh, five years ago or so, so they have a really ro robust transaction thing where if you need to submit multiple writes that either succeed or fail together, you can do that in a Dynamo transaction. So if you have five items that you need to write conditions on all of them and one of them fails, it'll roll back that entire batch for you. Um, why is this useful? I'd say, um, so this is going to be useful when you need to manipulate multiple records at once. This is actually like less common in most event-driven applications, right? Because your downstream consumers aren't usually responsible for maintaining con constraints, right? If you're like, if your upstream service is creating a user, your downstream service isn't going to say, hey, that user already exists, right? It's, already, it's asynchronous, it's decoupled, like it can't really make that claim on it. But sometimes you might want to like maintain counts or something like that where you're you know, inserting a record, but you're also incrementing a count somewhere else. And doing that in a Dynamo transaction with conditions can be a good way to, to maintain that. So DynamoDB transactions are great for multi-item constraints. 
<coughs> and then just going further on idempotency, you can with DynamoDB transactions, you can actually include an idempotency token, which is just like some some token you send up with your transaction. It'll make sure that that request is not double processed at all. That's only within a 10 minute window. So I, th I, I think it's kind of limited how useful that is, but I think the condition expressions, DynamoDB transactions are really useful here. All right, so that's how Dynamo is useful in an EDA consumer. Let's, let's wrap this up with some, some takeaways here. Um, big takeaways here is like, hey, DynamoDB is unique. If, you, if you're using DynamoDB, um, it's going to be different than a relational database. Again, it has some really strong benefits and capabilities. It also has some unique downsides, but I, I think they do work. So like, in terms of its strengths, right, that predictable performance at any scale, it's really nice. It, it's essentially set it and forget it, right? Assuming you've modeled your data correctly, you're just not going to have to worry about this like sort of de uh, your performance degrading over time. It also has those dynamic scaling capabilities where like you can change how much capacity, how much throughput you have throughout the day and really save a lot of money in a way that you can't with a relational database or you can do that paper use billing as well. And then because it has that strong leader model in contrast to like some earlier NoSQL databases, you can still maintain constraints and handle conditions and things like that. That one constraint that it does have is just like, hey, limited query flexibility, right? It's not going to give you a lot of flexibility on your queries. But again, in a world of event-driven applications, this is usually not as important. So my big claim there is, hey, event-driven applications benefit from strength and don't need the missing features um, from Dynamo. So that's what I have. Um, thanks for coming. I'll